போட்டோ எடுக்கணும் அப்புறமா
Thank you, Professor Mount, for that very generous introduction. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Prabhat for that. We met at the International Conference in Pondicherry University organized by Professor Mount a few months ago. And um, I was amazed at the presentation of Prabhat did about culture studies. And I was actually really amused to know that surprised personally to know that he had done his PhD before I heard of culture studies. He had done his PhD in culture studies. And his humor, his um, sense of uh, uh, intimacy that finally got me here for the first time. This is my first trip uh, to Illinois and I thank uh, Prabhaha and the University and Dr. Marx for this opportunity. Um, now, in the time allotted to me, I'd like to talk about nation and nationalism. How do we talk about something that we know very, very well? You know, the philosopher Beethoven has said something very interesting about Familiar. They said that the familiar, just because it is familiar, cannot be known. The familiar usually is not cognitively understood because it is familiar. We think that we know, and because we think that we know, we don't try to know further. There are so many ideas like that. Nationalism is one such. Take a on to say that the idea, any idea, when you analyze it, your actually your job is to destroy that idea, the form of that idea. You know, the form in which this idea has become familiar to us. The familiar is unknown. We think we know. This is this applies to the most common, most universal experiences, love and marriage. You begin with a passionate attachment, love, and then when you have the person for your life, you you fail or you stop because the. Because the principle of attachment moves or shifts, the modality of attachment shifts from, from love or passion to care and maintenance. Remember how we started with nationalism. We were passionately, atta passionately attached to nationalism. That's how we became free, our colonial modernity. Nationalism is actually the very act by which we became one. Nationalism is therefore not a result of modernity. It is a constitutive element of modernity. It constitutes modernity. The question is, we had enough of it. Like the lover you marry, you don't know how to care for it. Or do we care for it? Or do we care for it too much? Can we be after nationalism? That's a top topic, you know, nationalism and after. Is there an afterlife to nationalism? In an article written by Adam Roy in 2009, he asked another very interesting related question. He said, uh, a lot of people ask questions like, is there life after death? Let me add one more question to the thought. Is there life after democracy? This was a question she asked in 2009. And last week, in her address at, at, at a, an international conference in Sweden, she made a speech about, again, India and India's version of nationalism, where she actually said, she thought it herself. 
is that I'm going to court a line for myself. Not because I've, not to prove that I've been proven right, I told you so. No, because I think the demon is valid today. Is there life after democracy? What is nationalism doing? I mean, is there life after nationalism? What is nationalism doing to our democracy? We cannot be after democracy. Nationalism has its own advantages. I've heard about it. Should we be talking about a life after nationalism? Because in English, the word after itself has two meanings, mainly. You're after something when something is finished. Now that you're all after lunch. There's an after lunch session. But there is another meaning to the word, as you know. Just before an hour ago, just before an hour, you were all after lunch. Everybody wanted lunch. So when you look at the word after, I think the word would capture or open up in these two avenues, two, two ways. What I try to do today is to actually look at some of the theories within the time allotted to me. Um, I know the title is Imag Imagination or Imagining Nations and Dissemination. So the nation think disseminate. There are two links. I don't know how far I can go, but what I try to do is to take you through a few uh, works of literature, especially theory as well. I don't, uh, I think theory is literature. There is not. The most from this the way you understand theory. I, I, I mean, that's a totally different question. Anyway, let me begin with a quote from uh, E.V. Ramachandran's work. I, I've looked at some of the Indian uh, writings, but I don't think I'll have the time to quote them all. But let's begin. Let's talk about nationalism. Let's assume that nationalism, probably at least the concept of nationalism, is alive today more than any time in history. But it's being put to different uses. It's doing things to us. So instead of talking about the time given here in 1950, nationalism actually becomes problematic after 1950. At least, you know, the most important theorizations after, happen after that. I'll be looking at some of them. What exactly is nationalism, the way we understand it? Let me quote from a poem from E.B. Ramachandran. It's about, it's, the title of the poem is a, To a Writer in Exile. It's I think it was published in, in 1990 or something. <coughs> writer, to a writer in exile. This is what he says. Perhaps you have only crossed over the bridge, not burnt it behind you. And in the country and your exile, you will be aware of an absence as acute and real as the pain an amputee feels in the lost limb. An absence stronger than any presence. This is a point, unquote. He, a person who leaves his country or has to live in exile, feels the absence of his nation in himself like an amputee, somebody who has had their you know, leg amputated, feeling a pain in the amputed leg. We call it phantom pain. It is not there, it has been removed from his body, but still he feels that it's itching. This is the traditional notion of what we call a phantom root notion. So what I'm going to do is, nationalism began as an idea of roots, R-O-O-T-S, not R-O-U-T-E-S. Is it actually an absence stronger than presence, like Ivi Ramachandran puts it? If it is, why? In the earlier session, there was a question from the audience, and you were listening to the, you know, the streaming video about problems with conceptualization of the nation. There have been problems. I'm looking at three paradoxes in the theorization right, of what we call imagined communities. Earlier, Professor Harry Hill 
uh, refer to to Benedict Ganges and imagine the image. The problem, of, the problem of imagination is crucial to the concept of nationalism. And I think most of you are familiar with imagined communities as a work, probably as the most important work today of on nationalism. I'm not going into those details. But Barry's critiques of imagined community is actually a community imagined. Is, is it how a community becomes a nation? <laughs> Through imagination? Several critiques have disappeared from India. What is, of course, you know, G. Aloysius' work, Nationalism Without a Nation. He said, when you talk about imagination, when you say that nationalism, nationalism imagined, whose imagination are you talking about? India's nationalism, Aloysius says, is a nationalism without a nation. Because for him, or according to his reading, nation means the majority of the people. He says that the, the, what, what is being effectively introduced and practiced in India in the name of nationalism is actually the imagination of the high elite, the high class, or the high class, the, the Brahminical order. The nation is the people. The nation or nationalism is a protection of the people. You know, I'm sure you have resonances there. Ramshi, you know, Arjuna Padre, all these people have actually said the same thing. If it's a people, then can you say that in India the nationalism is the nationalism of the people? A little later, Vata Chatterjee raised the same question, but it's a different, in a different way. He said, when you talk about an imagined community, when you say that India is an imagined community, when you say that nation is an imagined community, whose imagination again are you talking about? Is it the Western European imagination? He critiques Benedict Anderson for saying or for believing that the modular forms of all nationalisms across the globe emerged from Europe. If we borrow the module from you, the modular form of nationalism from you, from Europe, from Britain, then what is left to imagine? That is his question. That is our imagination. No, we imagined our nation into being in our own way. We invented our own. I mean, if you don't have a modernity, but what's the challenge is problem with this. Whenever you talk about modernity or postmodernity, you have to, the constant references, always Europe, always the best. Why can't we be, can't we be modern in our own way? That is why what that says in one of his books, if you don't have a modernity of our own, an alternate modernity, you have to invent one. Deepesh Chakrabarti in his, you know, classic work called Provincializing Europe, talks about the same problem. You complain that an IT specialist in India would first do some puja before he starts, he, he caught his exam. An Indian, you know, a, an Indian would do a prog, either he would do a puja or he would pray to some gods and then he would probably go and do his scientific work. This was cited as an example of contradiction, but Dibesh Chakravarti beautifully argues later, later actually also argues the same point. Now that's a clear proof of postmodernity actually. Isn't this what you mean by postmodernity? The ability to hold contradictory views at the same time in your mind and operate? Isn't that a wonderful example of postmodernity? What do you say? So anyway, then we have other varieties, other, other critiques of imagination. Kanja Ilaila, for instance. Buffalo nationalism. This problem again was that. But see, how do you, how do you, you know, consider cow as a kind of a national animal? How do you, why don't you talk about the buffalo, which is actually the, the animal of the poor, or the darlings of the, I mean, I mean, how do you, how do you privilege one over the other? So he, his book, Buffalo Nationalism, is subtitled The Critique of Spiritual Fascism. For him, it's a spiritual fascism. This is the kind of religion you should call it. 
this is the kind of God that you know you're passing on. Gopal is another great writer, you know, who has talked about the same aspect, actually, the same fundamental aspect. Let me just look at three important paradoxes of nation. Very simple paradoxes. And I look at contemporary India to, to help you, to help us understand this. And uh, we'll wind up. Paradox number one about nationalism is that nationalism appears to us as objectively modern but subjectively ancient. This is one paradox. We all believe that nationalism is a recent affair, not even 100 years old, at least in our part of the world. But somehow we talk about our roots, the roots of the nation stretching back to an immemorial past. How do you balance this notion of antiquity with the notion of modernity? It's not a simple matter, okay? It's a very serious matter. So I'll come back to it. But paradox number one is this. Modernity versus antiquity. On the one hand, nationalism appears modern. On the other, it appears very, very old. Second paradox is, it is theoretically universal, but practically particular. Theoretically, everybody has a nation. If you are born in a place, that place belongs to a nation, that nation is your nation. Theory. This is what theory says. But all over the world, countries are spending all their energies on deciding who actually in this particular nation is not part of the nation. We call it the paradigm of immunization. You know, if you have a virus attack, you will immunize yourself, you know, so that the virus is destroyed. Some people in this country are considered as viruses that should be destroyed, otherwise it will affect the health of the nation. Dalits, Muslims, Christians, you know. I'm not saying that every one of us, but the way nationalism is, practiced, is being practiced in India today, you know, we believe it's, it's universal when you talk about it. Everybody, then what are these refugees doing in the world? Why, why do we have such an influx of such a proliferation of refugees across the world? Because someone tells them, some people tell them that they're not part of their country, that they're not part, not the place, you know, that to prove that to produce papers. It was from five generations back to prove that you were born here. Then the third, so this is the second uh, paradox. How do we deal with this? At least the one is to me. The third paradox is nationalism as an idea is politically powerful, philosophically weak. Many writers have talked about the philosophical poverty of the concept of nationalism. I think the most important figure in that group would be Tagore. It's always been said. He hated the very concept of nation. But I don't think we can do without nations. So, no, that's not my argument. Let, let's look at it in some detail. In imagined communities, there is a particular quote that I'd like to read. Quote, if nation states are widely considered to be new and historical, if nation states are widely considered to be new and historical, the nation states to which they give political expression always loom out of an immemorial past. Nationalism must be new in your place, but the moment you become a nation, suddenly an immemorial past emerges from somewhere. And you have to be part of that past, you have to uphold that past. This book, Bending Animals and Imagined Communities, was actually published in 1980. I like the coincidence that Professor Harian was mentioning in his talk about Pickwick Papers, you know, there was an amazing coincidence that uh, Eric Hobsbawm's that book, The Invention of Tradition, was published in the same. Traditions are invented, he argues. Traditions which appear or claim to be old are of recent in origin and sometimes even invented. There was a time in India when Life was beautiful without Muslims. Wonderful, perfect. Don't ask me when, because it's about five, ten thousand years ago. And we are going to work hard 
to get to that place. Even we even had plastic surgery. How do we get to this place back? Where is this, this, this particular concern, this passion for? Is this how we care for national? So this is a fundamental, you know, fundamental paradox of our I'll, I'll quote from a poem from Sarutin Nayan. I quote, oh, and she is invoking the nation. Oh, young through all the immemorial years, rise, mother, rise, regenerate from that womb. And like a bride, high mated with the spears, they get new glories from thy ageless womb. That shall become the nails of souls. Unbelievable wisdom. This is the only way anybody who has, and those poetry of response, anybody who has written about nationalism, <laughs> have written about nationalism in Islam. They have glorified, I'm not talking about Chagor. This is what is actually happening here. Happening here. Um, nationalism, according to this way, is on the one hand modern, on the other hand, it is an it is a deceptive ideology, uh, according to some writers, because they believe that, you know, as Eric Hobson himself says in his article, Two Faced Chief Janus, is that it is a Janus face, two faced. One face looks towards the past, the other towards the present. There is um, one, one to the future. But the future part is deactivated now. We are asked to be proud and nostalgic about our ancient past. Nostalgia is beautiful. I don't have to tell you. It's beautiful. The beauty of it is that you can never be disappointed. Because it's a love. It's a pain. I'm sure you're all nostalgic about your schools. Most of the schools probably were experienced at the time as places of terror. Total institution where you had you were disciplined every day using all kinds of things. But now you go back, look at it. You love it because the word nostalgia comes from a combination of two words. No stores and algos. No stores means homecoming, algos means pain. So nostalgia arises from the pain of wanting to go home, but wanting to go home. I mean the pleasure of wanting to go home, but the pain of never being able to go home. Nostalgia is safe. As a political, as a political category, as a political ideal, it's extremely safe. You don't have to worry about gas prices, petrol prices. You don't have to worry about any of these weird problems because you have nostalgia. You have a, you have a wonderful tradition, and somebody will take us there. Hope can be disappointed. Nostalgia is unstoppable. There's a very recent book published in 2022 by, you know, um, Bargo, right? Uh, Daji Bargo, a university gem professor. The book titled Between Hope and Despair, 100 Ethical Reflections on Contemporary India. Then it talks about the same problem. Between, we are caught between hope and despair. Our nationalism is being, you know, is operating in this country. Our nationalism, <coughs> There is a small group, a fringe group, a group of people who believe that that would be a wonderful idea. Don't think that that's a small group. No. Even the so-called fence-sitters, even people who, who are secular, you know, like Foucault said, we all have some kind of microfascism in our heads. All of us are microfascists in some way. So this fascism in us tells us that probably this, that's a better idea. To go back to the past. Get about the present. This, this particular book says that a small population of the ID elite believes that this is a reason for hope. Whereas the rest who believe that this is a the way we use nationalism today ta to target a particular community, a particular group of people, a particular you know uh, section of the community. Gives us enough hope for despite. So there is a group that despites, there's a group that hopes. And the group that hopes is a minority, but the elite minority. They'll do anything possible to make sure that the majority of what Jeet Aloysius calls the nation, 
majority Gopi Prabhu who told the lie. In other words, antiquity, the feeling of antiquity is a subjective kind of subjective view. Aloysius actually is talking about these, these particular three functions of this. Somebody has to raise the hand for the next five minutes. Not now. Yeah, my test is sad, you know, the teacher don't really and we are very good at stopping when we have to stop. But this idea is very powerful. This idea of the ancient origin. You know, the uh, Eloshas argues uh, beautifully that there are three functions for this concept. One is it legitimizes the notion of creation, a particular kind of creation. It indicates the ideological direction and model. You have to go to that model. So that model is being imposed. Then it makes it possible for us to bring about certain desired exclusions and inclusions. We can decide who is nationalist, who is not nationalist. Why is it called? Look at the second paradox. Right? Of theoretically universal, practically particular. There are two words. I think Professor, uh, in the afternoon, the earlier session, the last session was he had a copy of uh, Baba's book with him, Nation and Nation. And, you know, we are, there are there are actually two kinds of nationalisms. One is a narrative, which we are taught right from school, all Indians are my brothers and sisters. That is the pedagogical version, that is a pedagogy we are all taught. That's called a narrative. Then there is a narration of who you are, based on your experience in real life. That's happening prophetically in your life. Every day. You cannot, you can believe in the narrative, you can you can actually write about the narrative and get high marks in the exams, I mean, otherwise you will fail the exams. You can do extremely well in the interview by actually producing that narrative as beautiful as you can. But in your actual life, if you are a Dalit, or if you are part of the underprivileged sections of the society, your narration is talking. Your narration is your performative enactment of the idea of nation. That happens every day. All of us, to all of us. You can talk all you want about nationalism on podiums like this. Actually, on podiums like this, we never touch the real problems. We talk about theories. That do not happen. Some people are actually totally averse to the religion. Here is very bad. What is this theory? So, all we have actually to understand the politics of nationalism in the proper sense. Because the earliest theories have told us that nationalism means the establishment of a homogeneous, empty time. Through print capitalism, you read the name, you read the name, same kind of newspaper, you listen to the same kind of TV, and you think that your time is the same as everybody's time. That's what Benedict Anderson says when he talks about the influence of print capitalism. Actually, if everybody consumes the same kind of TV, same kind of newspaper, same kind of journals, everybody, it's, a, it's, it's an age of positivity. And in the age of positivity, we never see reality for its own, you know, for, for what it's worth. But we are not actually a homogeneous society. No society is a homogeneous. India is a society of heterogeneous multiplicity. Look at this crowd from different parts of India, belonging to different cultural traditions, religious traditions, living together, never thinking about whether they are nationalist or not, never experiencing what others say you should immunologically react against. We are living, the space of modern life is generally heterogeneous, we know that. And that, if that is what we are trying to homogenize in the name of nationalism, then nationalism is there.
and skipping some of these poems from Chekhov and others. Why is it politically powerful? Philosophically weak. I don't have to give you, from India, I don't have to give you reasons for two reasons. Nothing is more powerful, politically powerful than nationalism. It is the game in town. Be careful when you, you know. That thing is okay. You watch a movie in theater, that kind of place, you stand up. When the whole, then the, the entire audience stands up, if somebody is not standing up, you don't know for what reason. Whatever the reason is, is a traitor. All of you together lynch him to death, and then of course you become national. This is where this becomes politically, philosophically weak as an answer. Raymond Williams in 1983, again the same year the book on the magic community was published, says this, nation as a term is radically connected with the word native. Nation, the word comes from native, because we all are native from some place. In that sense, nation began as a term. Because, he says, we are born into relationships which are typically settled in a place. This, he says, is a form of primary and placeable bonding. And this is quite fundamental to human life. And naturally involved. But then he says, I caught again, yet the jump from that to anything like the modern nation state is entirely artificial. There, there are normally things to some I will quote one more order, right? Danny Robson. No, it's forward. Why nationalism? He says, nationalism is one of those words that evokes a knee jerk. Invariably negative response in polite company. It has become an invariably negative response in polite company. Associated with military aggression, genocide, and ethnic cleansing, this idea of nationalism is now tainted by the worst horrors of the 20th century. Think about Nazi Germany. Nationalism, one kind or other. Nazi Germany believed in a virus, and they decided to immunize themselves against that virus, dealing with the Holocaust. You know, I don't have to tell you about it. Then there was another virus, the non-communist, the anti-communist, the anti-Marxist. was considered to be a virus in Russia and, you know, Cambodia and other places that led to genocides. Now in India, one of the greatest democracies in the world, there are constant calls for genocide of a certain group of people. We are tainted by this. That's why it's philosophically so weak. I think uh, Russia. Nationalism as a concept is still suffering. We are trying to take care of it. We are trying to maintain it. But it's worst, you know, Ugly heads are being raised everywhere. <laughs> you see this all over, not just in India, in many parts of the world. But then, the other dimension of life that is emerging right under our eyes could be explained with the word dissemination. Right in front of our eyes, this is the second part of the dissemination of traditional values. There is a post national constellation of people, a group of people who actually not were not refugees, were not leaving their country because they have to. You know, when you talk about diasporas, right? you talk about three kinds of diaspora, basically. The diaspora of terror, refugees, people running away from war zones and so on. Then diaspora as a despair, people who leave their country because they're desperate, they can't get. And finally, diaspora as a hope, people who go to America, Canada, and so on, their own willing. I think we have a group of I mean, a lot of Indians, a lot of Indians now, graduates are thinking of not only studying in other countries, but setting down in other countries. They're looking for visas and so on. It's not just in India, all over the world, we have what is called diasporic tendencies across. Right? That's what we want. So, I'm, I'll just read this course and explain this in French. This is again a quote from Arjuna Padre, who talks about modernity at large. The court begins this way. The nationalistic genie, never perfectly contained in the bottle of the territorial state, is now it's a diasporic. 
Nationalism was a genie in the magic bottle. Now it has come out of the magic bottle and nationalism itself has become the bottle. In other words, in other words, that's what the SPR refers to sprinkling, spraying, spreading, straw, force. You know, see, this is, uh, I mean, a, 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 a concept of, of dispersion, distribution of people across the world. In other words, as philosophers like Habermas in his book, Post National Conversation, talks about, there is a pluralization of life forms taking place. Everywhere at different levels. On the one hand, there is a differentiation of social society in our multicultural lines. We see that every day. There is a diasporic movement that doesn't put an end to the notion of nation, but still important, but it's a that it is a pluralization of life forms. Second, there are processes that are taking place right in front of our eyes, processes of globalization, which undermine the very sovereignty of nation. <laughs> Two ways in which the concept of nation is understood. The point is this. The genie, nationalism is out of the bottle, the magic bottle. Now, as a Padre beautifully puts it in his title, modernity at large. Modernity is not restricted to one particular place. There was a time when it was believed that only the best is modern. Modernity is at large. Look at the phrase at large. At large is actually a term that refers to people who are criminals who are free to move around. So, like a criminal, modernity start moving around the world. The perfect example of this actualization is diaspora. Let me conclude with a quote from um, Aloysius. There's a Actually, it's a concluding line from Aloysius's work. Uh, Aloysius says, unless and until the formal becomes the substantial, the threat of the potential reversal of the break, modernity will hang like the sword of Democles over the head of the nation state. He's talking about India. He says that there is a contradiction in India between form and substance. In other words, in form, we have everything right. We have a constitution, one of the best in the world, the greatest of the books in the world. I mean, that's what most thinkers, that Rajiv Bhargava says, it's a great chapter on constitution. In form, we have everything. We have a powerful judiciary, we have a powerful, everything is there, right there. We have people's representation methods and so on. But in terms of substance, we are pretty little. Actually, our modernity was a movement from a particular substantial kind of a notion to a substantial, that is actually what happened during the early moment. But see, unless and until the formal becomes a substantial, now nationalism or you know love of nation, love of people, brotherhood, national brother, all this become that they are in the constitution. They're part of the formal life of us, but in substance, it's all by the Unless and until the formal becomes the substantial, the threat of the potential reversal of the break. A break took place in colonial modernity. We draw out the foreigners of it. We came together under the banner of a nationalistic passion. And then we draw them away. And that is a break with the past. But that break can be reversed. And if you don't really substantialize the formal break. Thank you very much. As usual, it was an amazing session. Uh, now the uh, lecture is open for discussion. Any questions to the uh, uh, resource question, Professor? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think the time is up. Uh, I just want to 
in a, when we are living in the age of post democracy, then after, after democracy, where does the quote unquote submerged masses, Giannis has spoken of this class? Uh, well, or you can get the second part of the question. Uh, what terms? In, in, the, in this age of post democracy, that is after democracy, where, where do the submerged masses stand? Yes. First of all, I would say um, that we are still not a post democracy. Very good question, by the way. No, no. I mean, yeah. Because that seems to be an assumption of the question. So that's why I'm saying I understand the point. Because that is my point, too. right? Because the kind of life. Uh, the kind of political atmosphere that we are living in is definitely in every way post democratic. And again, post democracy, I don't really think is a very bad idea. If you can, I mean, I believe that the detractors of post I mean, democracy should also be factored in in our understanding of nationalism. That's a different question. But your question is that is a big question, actually. G, you mentioned G. Aloysius. Yeah. What do yes. you say? Yes. G. Aloysius. Yeah. For, see, take that example, for instance, you know, for him, the nation is actually not a group of people, the elite, you know, group of people who make decisions and impose them on the entire majority. For him, the masses are the underprivileged, right? They are the people. They are the lifeblood of a particular country. And if you don't care for the lifeblood, and if, they, if, if, if this particular fire for the nation doesn't run in the bloodstream of the underprivileged. It's not nationalism, right? It is definitely not nationalism. This is the problem. Nationalism is amazing in so many ways as a structure, as an organizer, because it, it makes us move, it makes us organize. It is so many, you know, some of the best countries in the world are nationalistic, very nationalistic. I mean, they, they take care of their nation very well. But the problem in our country is that the RK, you know, the RK, <coughs> the civil dimension, are actually used as the basic political tool. You do whatever you want. A small, uh, you know, fight at the border between India and Pakistan settles the war in India. And everybody knows that. Nobody cares about, you know, the sufferings of the Dalits. Nobody cares about the problems that were, you know, were, were horrified about the possibilities of NRC. Nobody is bothered about the millions of people who are actually out of the national register. No, nobody is worried about that, right? Because decision comes from the top. It's not just you, it's not just the underprivileged. We, the so-called you know, privileged people, also are doing this lip service. So we, are, we don't talk about the big things at all. You know? Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Kulanwa, for that <coughs> wonderful session. Uh, on behalf of the Department of English, Shailas University, and Kulanwa uh, University and the University of Kandunat, uh, I profusely thank you for this wonderful session. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> friends, let us move on to the next uh, session. The next invited talk is to be delivered by Professor P. Kandan, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Postgraduate Studies and Research in English, Karnataka State Atta Mahadevi University, University, Vijay Dhabra Karnataka. Uh, I now call upon Professor P. Kandan to come out to the terrace and talk uh, about Professor P. Kannan is a long-time friend of both Professor uh, Prabhupada and Professor uh, Gita. He is a good friend of mine too. Uh, he has held positions like registrar, controller of examinations, and other important administrative positions as well. He is uh, an expert in subaltern historiography. 
So he is with us to deliver this talk on depiction of domestic colonialism in early Indian English. So without much delay, I invite Professor P. Kanwar to deliver this talk. In this session of the three day national seminar on nation, nationhood, and nationalism, a discourse on early Indian English literature from 1794 to 1950. The topic of my deliberation is depiction of domestic colonialism in the early Indian English novel. This is through ideology of race, culture, religion, language, civilization, etc. Apart from the conquest of foreign territories or countries, the colonizers used to construct the binary oppositions for controlling and maintaining the colonized like intellectuals, non-intellectuals, cultured, uncultured, organized, unorganized, civilized, uncivilized, pure, human defines internal or domestic with a single nation state society. We have in his annihilation of caste, which goes as I quote and unquote, a just society is a Dutch society in which ascending sense of reverence and dissenting sense of content is compassionate. In my deliberation, I attempt to show the depiction of domestic in K.S. Venkatramani's Muslim the Tiller which was published in 1910, Mudraja Ong's Untouchable in 1935, Raja Rao's Kandapura 1938, R.K. Narayan's The Dark Room 1938, and the case of Vinkat Ramanis, Raman Mudraja the Tiller is more about Romo as a social reformer. He is a servant in the form of Romo. But the novel is more about Romo. He is a college failure twice in Madras Christian College, which is also my alma mater. He comes back, decides to settle down in his native town called Alavandi, 
get married and looking after his land. He somehow got a job as a camp clerk in Kadapa. He goes to Kadapa. Usually this job is for three years. But he continues to work beyond three years with the patients. When he is about to quit this job because it is not suitable to his social status, he is appreciated by the collector and is promoted as deputy tasildar. He undertakes a very important project in a place called Dusi near Kanjipuram. The project of building a dam. He becomes a su successful in the construction of the dam and provides irrigation. So, to hundreds and thousands of farmers in the region. He is appreciated by the collector and he is invited by the collector for his appreciation. At this time, there is an escape of deposits from the jail he would be able to handle properly. He is given the responsibility of bringing back those who escaped from the jail. They are now in a place called Nagalapuram. He goes there with the assistance of a, a few police constables. When he goes there, he sees his own servant Murlan falls at the feet of Ramu and the whole team of deposits surrenders before Ramu and Ramu goes to the <coughs> government with an appeal that they should be pardoned, they should be excused. And Rama is given the same responsibility of building another dam in this place in Agalapuram. He goes there, builds a dam, constructs an ideal place for all people to live. This is also appreciated and he is receiving a letter as a collector. So this is the career of Ramu, which shows even though he is twice failure in BA graduation, he has patience, he has devotion, he, have, he has consistency and he is able to grow step by step to the position of a deputy commissioner. This is one side. There is another side, Murugan, whose social status is that of a serf, that of a servant. <laughs> His residence is described. In the beginning of the novel, I quote and unquote, therein lay an ancestral cottage of Murugan in peace and security for over seven generations. Murugan and his previous six generations lived in a small cottage. He is a dealer and he is given thorp. Tamil word is used in the novel thorp. We call it thorpu. 
for 500 rupees and Ramu goes away from this village. Murugan begins to till the land, he begins to prosper, but the next step is that of content. That he becomes a contractor of a toy shop in the village. People come to this toy shop, they drink. In the course of time, there is a riot for which this toy shop is responsible. Murugan is arrested. He is sentenced to two years of imprisonment with his friend called Thopai because he has got a huge belly. His name is Thopai. Both of them are imprisoned in the jail. Thopai is not ready to spend all two years in the jail. He wants to escape from there. There also, there is a Mughalian who helps them to escape from the jail. They come to this place, Nagalaburu. It is a hilly place. They indulge in departing. And you have a kind of a parallel situation here that Murugan is incapable of <coughs> maintaining his will. He is incapable of maintaining his status. He is shown as a, a greedy man. He is shown as a lazy man, uncultured man, whereas Ramu is shown as a cultured man. So this is how there is a domestic colonialism in the novel Murugan the Killer. It's not only in the career of these two people there is domestic colonialism, there is also Domestic colonialism in the language used by both of them. Nuda always calls him Swami. He calls Ramu Swami. He keeps on saying Ramu as Swami. There is also one Tamil Swami. Yes, Swami. Still, you can please your mother Swami. So this is how he addresses Ramu, whereas Ramu, who is anchored to Murugan in age, Muruga, Muruga. He calls him by his name, which is almost a sign of a disrespect content. We are able to see that this kind of domestic colonialism is found in the language which is used by the two sections of the people, one higher section, the other is a lower section. In K. Vinkatramani's Bandhan the Patriot, once again, this novel is revolving around two sections of the people. One section of the people belongs to so called the caste Hindus. They are Rangaswami, Rajeshwari, Ravu, Padma, Saraswati, and etc. There is another section of the people who belong to the backward community in the hierarchy like Kandam, Purnan, Kamakshi, Chukkalinga Mudaliya. There is freedom struggle. There is a participation from the caste Hindus, the highest hierarchy. And there is also participation from the backward community society, Odaliya community. But though there are characters from untouchable community, they are not shown to be participating in the freedom struggle. In other words, it shows that they do not have a noble pursuit, a higher pursuit. This noble pursuit is something which is always only for the higher cost people. There are two 
sections of this under the under under Chitral community. It is said in the novel, Nandan, Mughal, and Bhatteri led the band of aged patrons. Irnan, Tarupan, Irlapan led the band of daring youngsters. These two groups of untouchable, two groups belong to the untouchable classes. What is very important here is that there is a freedom struggle. The upper caste people give up their ICS positions. They give up their higher job positions. They, they, they give up their property. Come and participate in the freedom struggle. Whereas the people of lowest section are portrayed to be always indulging in consumption of a toddy, the local rat. This kind of a grid taken from coconut tree. So this is how they are shown where there is domestic colonialism. One is shown as a culture, principle, almost with a lot of noble ideas, the other section is shown to be devoid of that, to be lacking of this. It is said in the novel about the people who belong to the lowest strata, I quote and unquote, a part of body is the only friend of the paria has in the world. It is so demeaning that the people of this community are portrayed only as the lovers of a dog. They do not have any national responsibility. They do not have any national duty. Whereas the other section of the people have nationalism, national spirit. This is how the novel which talks about Indian nationalism, Indian freedom, denies the same nationhood, the same freedom to the underprivileged sections of the people. So this is how it is going on. In the next novel, Mulkaraj Anand's Untouchable, which was published in 1937, we are able to see domestic colonialism in the depiction of how Bhakta is treated by high society. We know the novel, we know the plot. Bhakta is coming along the street. There is a jilebi shop. He is tempted to taste this jilebi. He goes and buys and he pays for this. And after he pays, how he is treated he is an example of domestic colonialism. I quote and unquote, he placed four nickel coins on the shoe board for the confectioner's assistant who stood ready to splash some water on them and he walked away embarrassed. The coin which is given by Baba is purified by pouring water, by splashing water on this. This is a domestic colonialism. One section of the people are treated as colonized, treated as slaves, treated as serfs. And there are also traditions which are examples of domestic colonialism in untouchable. That untouchables are not freely allowed to walk along the road whenever they feel like. Whenever there is another higher cost man is found on the road, he is supposed to give side. This tradition is also there in untouchable, which is an example of domestic colonialism. I quote and I unquote. Keep to the side of the road, you low cost vermin. He suddenly hear, heard someone shouting, Do you know you have touched me and defiled me? Now I will have to go and take bath to purify myself. This kind of tradition is a tradition of colonialism. We are reminded of apartheid law, the law which was implemented by the colonizers in Africa where the native people were not allowed to go to the parks, to go to the halls of entertainment, 
they did not have a freedom to move wherever they wanted the same condition is prevailing in india which is a domestic colonial situation the same people of india but belonging to lower strata are treated as almost like the colored people treated in south africa by the whites there are there were traditions and the traditions are also reflected in the novel he is reminded that whenever he walks along the road side the street side he must make an announcement that he is coming so that the caste hindus will not come that side and get shadow polluted i quote and unquote posh keep away posh sweeper coming posh posh sweeper coming posh posh sweeper coming this is a tradition which prevail in the country which is also reflected in the novel and this is the tradition of a domestic colonial tradition people are treated as colonized within their own country within their own society and the language which is also used is discriminatory as we saw in the previous novel the low caste people are addressing the higher caste people oh maharaj maharaj they address them maharaj whereas the higher caste people treat them very badly use the language like this get away you nice curs get out of the way you swine you pocket son you swine you dog low caste vermin get off steps you are scavenger you dog so in language also there is a discrimination the language is used by upper caste people towards the lower caste people is full of contempt whereas lower caste people are using the language of reverence to address the higher caste people so this is how we are able to see domestic colonialism in kanda in raja in in Uh, untouchable also raja ram sandapura is a very famous novel of indian freedom struggle it was described that whatever happened in kandapura happened everywhere in the country there was this kind of a remark about kandapura but if you go through the novel very minutely you will see the examples of domestic colonialism the streets are named after the caste when the streets are named after the caste the higher caste streets are respectable whereas the caste names the names of low caste streets are irrespectable you see in the novel brahmin quarter a paraya quarter bhatas quarter a weavers quarter and shudra quarter and the characters of low caste people are given the prefix of caste which is not given to the upper caste people paraya sidha paraya ramaka paraya tippa paraya work and names also paraya work paraya business so this is how names are also used with the caste names which show contempt towards them when murti is coming back from the street to the house his mother is speaking to him like this i quote and unquote go and stand on the steps like a paraya you have visited the street of paraya because you have visited the street of paraya you have become yourself a paraya go and stand on the steps like a paraya let not your shadow fall on me enough of it so this is how names of the streets are also indicating domestic colonialism then he goes to the house of one of the untouchables he is making canvas of gandhi movement he goes to the house of lingamma the whole happened
happening shows domestic colonialism very vividly. I illustrate this from the novel for your reference. I quote and unquote. He has gone to the house. Lingama is inviting him to come and sit inside and this goes. He looks to this side and that and thinks surely there is a cat ass in the backyard and is surely being skinned and he smi smells the stench of hide and the stench of pickled pigs. He would like to say hurry home, hurry home. And she comes with a glass of milk, she is offering to Moti, accept this from this poor Hassi. Moti says, I have just taken coffee, Lingamma. She interpret, interrupts and says, touch it, Murtapa, touch only as though it were offered to the gods and we shall be satisfied, sanctified and Moti with many of trembling prayer touches the tumbler and brings it to his lips and taking one sip lays it aside. Then he comes back home and he is staying in Randamasa house. He is coming there. What happens is a very right example of domestic colonialism. I quote and unquote. But as he goes up the steps, something in him says, Nay. And his hair stands on the end as he remembers the tumbler of milk and the paraya home. He says to Nandama, he has gone for the first time, entered a paraya house and asked if he is permitted to enter. And Nandama says, just come the other way around, Muti. There is still hot water in the call room and fresh clothes for the meal. So Murti goes by the backyard when he has taken his bath and clothed himself. Randama says, maybe you better change your holy thread. So there is national movement one side fighting for the freedom from the colonizers. The other side within the country, the same freedom is denied to the people of the same village. In the same whole country, there is a denial of freedom, there is a practice of untouchability and this is what is paradox in the freedom struggle. I will quickly finish in five minutes. Then we have R.K. Narayan's The Dark Room, which was published in 1938. It was published by Macmillan in London. I say this because in 1938, a very few people could read English in India. A very few people could read and understand English in India. And uh, I don't know whether there was any percentage from the backward community to read and understand English. It was published in London. When people read the novel in London, what kind of image they get about our people here is something very important. This is about the family story of Ramani and Swamitri. Ramani is working in a in a in a, some company. They have a three children, two boys and one two two daughters, one boy. Ramani pursues post-marital relationship with his colleague Shanda Boy from Mangalore. She becomes upset. She gets headache, she goes to the dark room whenever there is a headache for her. Then she tries some methods to impress her husband, to draw her husband towards her. She fails. Later, she decides to commit a suicide. She goes to the river and jumps into the river to kill herself. She is rescued by a man called Mari who is a blacksmith and burglar. He is the one who visits the street for lock repair, lock and key repair. Whenever he finds some houses locked for many days, he also enters and makes theft. He also steals property from there. This 
woman belongs to upper caste and she is rescued by Mari. Mari takes her to his house. His wife, Pony, cooks food for her. She offers food cooked by Pony, but she is not ready to eat the food cooked by Pony. She does not want to eat food outside in the house of her, not her community, upper class community. She sells for banana from the shop. She gets banana from the shops and she survives on the banana brought from the shop. This is a typical domestic colonialism. One side, we are talking about the freedom for all. The other side, the woman is not ready to eat food in the house, the owner of which has rescued her life. She then, then goes to the temple, she serves in the temple for some time, then she realizes she goes back to her house. My idea of sharing with you, the idea is that there is a domestic colonialism. This Savitri, who belongs to upper caste, is saved by Mari, who belongs to lower caste. She should have been grateful to him. She should have been faithful to him. Whereas she treats him as a man of low caste. And this attitude is the attitude of colonization. And that happens within India, so it is domestic colonialism. <laughs> Another novel is Arkan Orange, The Guide. You also know this. I would like to draw your attention to domestic colonialism in this. Rosie, who is the wife of Margot, is separated from her husband by Railway Raju. He observes her interest inclination towards dancing and he makes her a great popular dancer. This is one side. But let us try to understand the background of Rosie. Rosie tells this to Raju, I quote and unquote, I belong to a tra family traditionally dedicated to the temples as dancers. My mother, grandmother, before her, her mother. Even as a young girl, I danced in our village temple. You know how our caste is viewed? Raju says, it's the noblest caste on earth, I said. We are considered, we are not considered respectable, we are not considered civilized. These are the qualities I mentioned at the beginning or the attributes given by colonizer to the colonized. She is a dancer from the traditional dancing family and she is not recognized, she is not civilized, she is not respectable. A different life was planned for me by my mother. She put me to school early in life. I studied well. I took my master's degree in economics. Now, Rosie is a male in economics. In 1958, if anybody had completed MA in economics, she or he would have got a good job. She would have got a government job or a private job. She would have got a good job. But in the novel, though she is MA in economics, she is married to a professor, separated from him, becomes a mistress of a railway Raju. Then she is sent back to Madras, where she is going to start her career as a dancer. She may be a public dancer today, but that is once again the continuation of her past tradition. Her mother was dancing in the temple, now she is dancing in the open stage in the village. Whereas Raimi Raju is a school dropout. He could not complete his school education. He goes to railway station where there is a bookshop of his father. Sometimes he works there. Then he becomes a railway Raju. He becomes a tourist guide. He is committing forgery. He is imprisoned. Then he comes out. He is mistaken for Swami, Sadhu. And though he is a fake Sadhu at the beginning, at the end of the novel, he goes to the river, he drowns himself, he becomes a genuine Swami. He is given dignity. He is given respect. He is promoted, elevated to a very genuine Swamiji or Sadhu 
according to Hindu tradition, whereas MA graduate is pushed back to her old tradition of Devadasi, of uh, dancing in the temple, which is a clear example of uh, domestic colonialism. I said at the beginning that there are two types of colonialism, external and internal. This internal colonialism prevailed in our country from the time immemorial. It is continued. Professor C. Ramachandran, he was a professor of English in Mangalore University. He translated Virapa Moini's novel called The Age of Time. It is a Dalit novel written by a non-Dalit writer. He has also given introduction to this novel. In the introduction, C. Ramachandran very clearly shows that there was already colonialism before the arrival of East India Company in India. There was already domestic colonialism in our country. I would like to conclude my talk by quoting what Professor C.M. Ramachandran has said regarding this. I quote and unquote. For besides the 200 years of world colonial hegemony, there existed in Indian society a thousand year world hegemony based on caste and gender. In such a hierarchical society, each social group imposed its religious, economic, cultural hegemony over the groups that were below in the social ladder. The worst victim of such a hierarchy was the group that was placed at the not only bottom of the social ladder but beyond the Varnashrama system, the Panjamas, which group included numerous scheduled cause, scheduled tribes. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kamil, for that brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, it was an incisive, a very unsentimental uh, presentation. Um, the point of contention put forth by Dr. Kamil is that even before the establishment of the British East India Company and its subsequent colonization, uh, there existed colonization. And uh, even after the exit of the British East India Company and the colonization process, the colonization went So he was highly critical of what uh, we always understand as internal colonization. So uh, without uh, clearing this internal colonization and its uh, you know, impact on ordinary people, the masses, uh, it would be rather difficult to discuss nationalism. This is what he uh, has tried to come from his lecture. This lecture is open for discussion now. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, Are there any questions uh, online? Yes, yes, sir. We have a few questions and a few comments on the speech. Uh, shall I go to the administration first? Yeah, no, no questions. 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 But that's not what you want. You give one person to. One appreciation. First appreciation and then guest. Yeah, yeah, please. Sir. Thank you for your insightful analysis of the cultural and political uh, context of these novels. Was truthfully illuminating and providing a unique perspective on the impact of colonialism and Indian society. This was a comment by Arvind Kumar. And uh, now I have a question uh, by uh, Mary Shiny. I'm curious to know if you think this theme still resonates in contemporary Indian English literature 
and if so, how it has evolved or been transformed over time? Please repeat the question. If you think this theme still resonates in contemporary Indian English literature, and if so, how it has evolved or been transformed over time? I strongly believe that this is the unique thing till date, not only in Indian English literature, but also in the Indo Indian diasporic literature. Salman Rushdie, in his Indian children, says that the upper caste people do not want to touch in him, even in the mind. Just one sentence which talks about the mental untouchability which is practiced nowadays. Chitra Benji is part of Chitra Benji is In Chitra Brandi's two novels, we are able to see continuation of casteism abroad. And we have made a French novel by Bangladesh writer. She is now in Delhi. She was also a diasporic writer. I forgot her name. Neela is a Dalit character who is married to a French restaurant owner in France. Casteism is continuing there. Then, Professor uh, Prabhakar spoke about it, similar problems in Bharatas University some 15 years ago. Shyam Selvagodai's novel, Cinnamon Garden, is a novel where there is a there, there are diaspora from India, Mughalaya community. They are not ready to marry the Dalit community women in Sri Lanka. He is ready to have license with the Dalit woman when his son Arun is in the love, in love of a Dalit girl. He is uh, excommunicating him. He doesn't want to see him. He comes to India, he goes to Bombay, he dies there. So, this fascism has not only prevailed, continued in India, in Indian English literature, it is there in diaspora literature also. There is one um, Indo British. Punjabi writer, I have forgotten, but she has written Shame, Daughters of Shame, Shame continues, a very nice writer. There also in England, in among the diaspora of Indian, Indo British diaspora, there is costism. Inter caste marriage is prohibited. It is a taboo. Actually, when the girls are very young, young the photos are sent to India, Punjab, and uh, the groom's photos are also sent here. Marriage is done without the boy and girl see each other. There is once again intercostal love, but honor feeling is what is the result there. So this is how this continues not only in it, it's a reflection of what is continued in the society. It is there in Indian English literature at present and in the Indian diaspora literature also. Thank you. Sister of my heart is the novel name. Yeah. Sudha falls in love with a Talit boy. She is prevented to marry him. She is married to her own caste man. Later, her mother-in-law is uh, very bad. When the fetus is known female, she is uh, driven away from home. She comes to America with her cousin, Anju. She gives birth there. The boy continues. He goes to London also. But they are not able to continue their past love because of this past barrier. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. We understand that even after having so much of education and culture, we have not yet civilized. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I uh, thank Professor Kannan for that wonderful session. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more uh, session now. Uh, it is the ninth invited talk uh, by Dr. Rajesh Kavinkar. Uh, 
Associate Professor, Department of English, University of Mumbai, Maharashtra. I uh, now invite Professor Ajit Kamal to the dais and provide He is with us to uh, deliver his lecture titled Homes Within the Home and Nations Within the Nation a critical perspective. So without uh, much ado, I now invite Dr. Rajesh Karankal, a friend and associate professor, Department of English University of Mumbai, to deliver this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Marks. <laughs> I'm very happy that I'm able to speak to you today on this very, very engaging, interesting topic which concerns all of us. Dear academics, scholars, researchers, students, friends. Since yesterday, we have been giving different views on this theme of nation, nationhood, and nationalism. But what has been spoken about? And it is therefore, I really need to modify a lot from my argument and delete a lot of things for the fear of repeating itself. Speakers and scholars before me, the persons before me have been very clear as to what is the nation and how it exists in our imagination and also in practice. We have been given to understand certain notions about nation, nation, nationalism from academic syllabus. The books which are prescribed by certain formal bodies, and we are, we are made to discuss them in the classroom. While doing so, the other side of the story gets sidelined. Number one. Number two, sometimes the academics doesn't train us to think critically enough to also apply our mind and interrogate the other side of the story. And it is therefore. Seminars and conferences like these are extremely important, I feel, and I'm sure this seminar particularly is doing the same thing. There could be a lot of things which we know and we believe they to be true. Excuse me, Dr. Rajesh. I have one uh, announcement to make. All the technical sessions will be held only in this talk after this lecture. So, no one has to move out from this hall to the halls where we are allotted to you. I invite technical sessions to be held only in this fashion. Thank you, sir. So, the other thing, the other side, and in the post learning these things in academics in the classroom, we develop a kind of faith. That whatever I learned in the classroom is the only reality, and there is no relation beyond this. And therefore, when, when scholars and academics will come here and talk to you on the other side, sometimes it becomes a little shocking. Because we feel the speakers and speakers are biased then, but then there are always two sides, and the other side is now presented by several scholars who spoke. What's expected in academics and research is that we need to be impartial, going beyond biases. But even though we expect this, there is certain bias which is formed in the process of learning in the classroom. And then, in society, when we move, society gives us a particular kind of narrative. Politics gives you another kind of narrative. 
And depending on the convenience, we choose and adapt to certain narratives beyond which we do not want to think, we don't want to listen to them. But we say we should overcome what is called uh, what's called cognitive bias. Usually in society like ours, what happens is we repetitively want to think and listen to what we like. What we do not like, we do not want to listen to that. Look at music. Same thing happens. What's quality bias? It is, if you like a particular song, you would like to repeatedly listen to that song. And if you do not like something, you want to disassociate with those kinds of things. By getting friendship, same thing happens. If I belong to a particular class, particular class, particular ideology, I will refrain from those locations who will speak what I like. And we will only discuss those things and nothing beyond that. So in the classroom also, suppose I am a Brahmin, I will have those friends who will speak what I like. Other people form a different group with which I want to associate with all the time. But are we going to really overcome this bias or not? That's the question. And I think by such critical engagement, we will surely rise beyond those things. Now when we talk about when we talk about nation, nationhood, nationalism, there are, there are different narratives of nationalism. There are different narratives of being a nation. And we selectively choose them and we tend to adhere to those ideas. Now when in India we talk about nation, we know that apart from a mainstream, there is a voice on the margin which we do not listen to very much. And therefore, when I when I today's deliberations, you see, they have spoken about the marginal voices and their own notions of nation, nationhood, and nationalism. And I really appreciate that. In India, we know. Even before the British has arrived in India, we are aware that the British people arrived, they spread the network of communication, and then we started getting to understand what the nation is like. Nine, before 1947, we did not have a very, very clear idea of India being a nation because for the lack of communication. And there were different linguistic groups, different linguistic regions. And then you ask me, what was then? What was the India before 1947? Some scholars say that it was a huge stretch of land ruled by kings, queens, princes, and all of them fighting among each other. Britishers, to a great extent, solidified and communicated and connected those things and brought them under a common control, which gave an advantage. During freedom struggle, that we want freedom as a country, as a nation. They started talking about it. But what was what was their idea of nation? What was their idea of nation? They wanted freedom to a particular group of people. Who were those who were enslaved by the British? The Dalits. The women or the dominant caste or class in this country. It is therefore we reach a very, very popular group to which reference was made in the previous scriptures, Gandhi and Ambedkar. What did they want? And therefore, when Gandhi and Ambedkar used to meet, they used to have this kind of debate. Because Dalits were enslaved by the, the brown side, and the brown side was enslaved by the white masters. <coughs> if this was the kind of scenario, then who was in urgent need of that freedom? That was the question, which, which we have to understand. But even then, there is there is a, a all organization which claims and we all don't understand 
that Ram Madhav who belongs to us, he explains this notion and he says that even if you people argue that nation is a very recent concept, we in India had this concept in the name of trust. And they quote him. We have to understand and take their views also in consideration, which are very, very important. Ramadu says that the Rashtriya concept of Rashtra, the Bhartiya concept of Rashtra, could be considered a parallel to the Western term nation. But both are also different on several counts. The primary difference between the two stems from the fact that Rashtra is more of ethnic spiritual concept, while nation is the cultural concept. Many leaders, like Sri Aurobindo Gandhi, Pandit Nehru, Vijayendra Kadorji, and Dinda Rupatjari, well into the idea of Indian nation and nationality. Now these, these ideas are either spiritual, metaphysical, or static. But here, we should also stop talking. If this is the mainstream idea of nationalism, there are other people who do not belong to this mainstream, who are not considered mainstream. Everything, a view of a minority becomes an Indian view, a culture of a minority becomes an Indian culture, the language of a minority can become Indian language, whereas the culture of the non mainstream would either be an elite culture, or a tribal culture, or a minority culture. This was the scenario. And therefore, Dr. Ambedkar, views are extremely important for this. Here, we should explore the Dr. Ambedkar's ideas and reflection of nationality. Mr. Swadesh Singh, in his article, calls him the most celebrated Indian leader, thinker, and social philosopher of the 21st century, who contributed in the 20th century. And large scale celebrations of his birth anniversary are marked in the recent past. Observers felt that these celebrations were most widespread than those in the central year. One of the leading mainstream magazines termed him as the greatest leader of modern India. Now these, these two very, very important narratives, one is a direct of, of nation and nation building and freedom. One is the dominant caste narrative, another is one the When when Gandhiji, when Ambedkar met Gandhiji, Mr. Mahatma Gandhiji told Ambedkar that Ambedkar, why don't you devote your energy? Fully for the independence of the country. And America said, I would like to. And we will be doing that. We are doing it. But then, you will speak about Swatantya, that's freedom. Swatantya, what about Samuta? That is also equally important. Because we need to free the slaves from the dominant clutches. And therefore, several pilot networks could be. Could, could exist, but under the narrative is very, very important. Uh, another narrative, this is based in one, when Bino Mittal gave another narrative, he talked about freedom of India from social inequality and freedom of India from the untouched This would be understood as a narrative from the below for the development of the downtrodden, deprived, and marginalized sections of society. The section that did not have any Participant in the public life of colonial India, Dr. Ambedkar becomes the leader and he gives voice to those people. According to Isim Gaikavar, he says that without Ambedkar's opposition to mainstream nationalism, the process of internal confrontation of the nation would not have been carried out sufficiently enough to strengthen and broaden the social base of Indian nationalism. Now, when I, when I do this, in the next 20 minutes, I am going to ask you, sir. I know around 45 how difficult it is to listen to such things. But even then, there is there is a very, very popular misunderstanding about who is that. When I when I assess dissertations of my scholars, I mean the PhD scholars, I see them they are routinely confusing these two terms. Shudra and Dalits. Now, can you, as a students, can you tell me who is, who is Dalit? What do you understand by the term Dalit? In Sanskrit, it refers to Dalit. 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 Dalit.
Squeezed. Yeah, yeah. That is that is the origin of the word Dalit, right? Squeezed, suppressed, or the oppressed. But in popular terms, when you use this term in society, who is a Dalit? And I know there is no communication possible without the distance. I will give you a few options. Usually, people think Dalits are untouched. Then the second question is, who is Shudra? Is Shudra different from the Dalit? Or are they the same terms? Are they synonyms? There is a film called Shudra. On reservation. In Hindi, it is a Bollywood film. And when Shudra is spoken about, in the film, untouchables are shown. As if Shudras are untouchables are the same. In fact, Shudras are different from untouchables. And at least for those, if you, if you think this becomes a little more relevant to them, I'd like to explain, take two moments and speak on this. Shudras are part of the four Varna. Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vesha, and Shudra. The Shudras are part of the Varna. And the Shudras are unpaid servants of the upper three Varna. Untouchables are beyond Varnas. And therefore, Shudras, are, Shudras become part of the Savarna because they are the Varna system. Untouchables are beyond the Varnas. Therefore, in Hindu cosmology, when they speak about the existence of the entire world and the universe, as if untouchables were not thought of. How did they come from? Because in the cosmic man Brahma, according to the theory in the Rigveda, Brahmins came out of the mouth. Shatriyas came out from the arms, Vaishyas from the some people say stomach, some say eyes, and Shudras from the feet. Where did the untouchables come from? Who were these people? Untouchables were actually the people who did not belong to this Varna system at all. And therefore, people misunderstand the act of the measure of burning Manuskriti, they think. Because the miracle is untouchable, he thought this, this, this scripture is against him and there is people, he was right. In fact, Manuspati world has more to do with the Shudra than the women rather than the untouchable because the punishment of untouchable was decided more by the religious pundit rather than the scriptures. It is for the, it is for the women and therefore in 1972 when the Dalit Panthers were formed in Bombay, they declared the manifesto the next year, and in the manifesto they defined this term Dalit. Once again, to tell people that Dalit, because Sir rightly said, thank you, Professor Gandhi, for this, that it means the suppressed, the oppressed, the exploited, the depressed ones that include the Sudras, the untouchables, the tribals, and all the women of all the Varnas. And therefore, Mahatma Jutra Phule, when he, when he describes and he talks about this, he talks about Shudras and Ati Shudras. There is nothing like Kipta Varma. Kipta Varma does not have any sanctity in the scriptures of the Adi Sanatana Dharma, of the Brahmin Dharma, or what we call Hindu, Hinduism today. Women, women of Hindu Brahmin families, if they are exploited, oppressed, and they are also justified in the scriptures, then they are also the Shudras. <coughs> now, how many women would accept this and agree with this? Though it is very, very true, very difficult because this has not reached them. The liberation of women's movement, which they have got easily in India, <coughs> women in India did not have to struggle to get their rights of voting. In Europe, women had to come on the roads to get the rights of franchise. In India, from fighters and social partners have given them this right. Even women coming out in demand on the roads in demand for this. Thing. And therefore, why women are shudras? Because women are not Chinese. Some very scholars feel and some anthropologists feel that according to the Hindu Dharma Shastras, women are not Brahmins, because why? A Brahmin is a Madhya, not a Brahmin. 
a Brahmin's wife is not a Brahmin, a Brahmin's daughter is not a Brahmin, his sister is not a Brahmin. Why? At present, the Upalaya ceremony is not possible for them. And a Brahmin becomes a Brahmin only by the Janayu ceremony, the third ceremony of the Upalaya ceremony. And women do not have the right. And therefore, given the Brahmin family do not have the privilege which Brahmin man possibly could be possible. So, what is she? She is only maintaining the supremacy. She is used to maintain the supremacy and authority of the Brahmin male folks. And therefore, few years, a few years in the past, few years, I mean, the history, women did not have right to education. Or all the rights which are not there for the Shudras, women in the Brahmin family also did not have these rights. And it is therefore, Mahapadutra also in Pune, when he writes his books, he writes about this, that women are also part of these Shudras. This is one, this is one, this is very, very important. And then, and then, going by the, going by the invasion theory, why, why, why a branded male did not give rights to his own women in the family? Certain poets, the little poets in Maharashtra and also the little poets in Bengal, they have commented on this. Their commentary is that when, when a cosmic man gave birth to these men, Brahmins were born, Kshatriyas were born, Vaishyas were born, Shudras were born. Were these men also born that time? No. Because the notion of Varma only talks about men who were born. Because women did not have the right to take arms even if they are women of Kshatriya, Kshatriya Varma. Brahmins are Brahmin, women did not, the women did not have the right to perform certain rituals. And therefore, they were to be used and controlled to maintain rule. Why is, why is marrying within a caste? Endogamy is a fundamental feature of caste. Why is Brahmin or a Kshatriya or a Vishya man controlling the woman? Because according to them, if a Brahmin woman marries outside the caste, the purity of the caste will be in danger. And therefore, if the purity is in danger, the supremacy would not be achieved. And there is no supremacy because caste gives them privilege. And therefore, the caste has to be made supreme, and therefore, controlling women becomes an important factor. And therefore, as, as for the feminist and Dalit feminism now, the, the problems of the female are not only within the man versus the woman, but within the woman versus the system. The social system just be taken into consideration. And this is one. Second thing, there is another argument by some other scholars in the field, and I, I mentioned these two books about the Aryan Vijayanthi. I know Dr. Ambedkar rejects the Aryan Vijayanthi. Those, those who are part of the Varma system, they say, no, invention is truth. And therefore, Bhargangadhar Tilak in Maharashtra is known as Lokmanya Bhargangadhar Tilak. And Pandit Jalal Nehru, Tilak writes a book called The Arctic Home in the Vedas, where he mentions that the Aryans to whom is beyond India, and they came from the Arctic region to India. This invasion theory is being supported. And the discovery of India by Pandit Nehruji, he was supposed to. Now, to the point is, when invaders go to any part of the world, they do not carry women with them or they carry very few women with them. Why? Because the biological processes, women become hindered in the way of invasion. So, when they invade and they defeat, the one who gets defeated, they women are lost and utilized for propagating their version. And then, then the scholars argue that hypothetical, that is therefore that women would not be given the rights in the feminists because they thought she is not their own. If the theory is to be considered true, she is not their own and therefore Michael Banshar, the American anthropologist, came to University of Andhra University in Vishakha Prashnam and they carried out research. In fact, genetics they found out that the genes of the, the iron-looking male 
are matching with the Asian people, and the genes of the Brahmin women are matching with the more and more with Indian Asiatic women. That corroborates the very fact that Aryans must not have carried their women with them. This is this is one. And therefore, when women are part of Dalits right now, then we have to we have to go by their version. Why did women not arrive? So freedom for what? Freedom from whom? That is an extremely important question that one needs to understand. In the when, when the Dalit literature was emerging in Maharashtra, the most important question on the results, and you must have heard of him. When Dr. Ambedkar was arguing with Mahatma Gandhi, and when they read about this, they started writing poems that do we really, are we in urgent need of freedom or are we in urgent need of liberation from our own people? That was the question. And therefore, on 15 August 1947, we got independent, and we heard. The extremely memorable speech of Pandit Dhamdhan, the first Prime Minister of India. On the second day, there were a lot of people saying, What is it? And in what way is it going to benefit us? That means the Indian Freedom Struggle Movement for the liberation of the nation. A lot of people were not part of, and therefore, there were two stakeholders in this. So, Ambedkar says, what Ambedkar says, that how can people divide, to, divide into several thousand castes can be arranged? Because if nation means feeling of oneness, and oneness among the people of a particular nation, if you don't feel one with many other of my own countrymen, then can that society be a nation? So whether India is a nation or India is a nation in making, the keynote speaker, Dr. Rajendra, Rajendra sir mentioned this, that India is, whether it is a nation or it is a nation in the making, this is the question. And therefore, the caste, Dr. Ambedkar calls them that the castes are anti national. If you and me, we claim that we are real Indians and we are truly patriotics, then we really need to think about the question of caste. And unless, unless we handle this question of caste very successfully, this will continue to create hindrances in the way of nation building. America says the caste are international in the first place because they bring about separation in social life. They are anti national also because they generate jealousy and antipathy between caste and other caste. Moreover, there is an utter lack of uh, consciousness of kind. That is, I feel one with somebody, number one, and I want to, I want to take him or her along to ensure that we as a group develop. There is, America says, there is no Hindu consciousness of a kind. In every Hindu, the consciousness that exists is the consciousness of his caste. This is the reason why Hindus cannot be said to form a society or a nation. He said that time. 95 years ago. Now, after so many years, have we been able to think about this? That is a very, very important question. And therefore, when Gandhiji was leading his book, Gandhiji wanted to take people along. We know Gandhiji published two newspapers. One is called Harijan. Second one is called Young India. Now, Gandhiji was, Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhiji was Titling his newspaper as Young India and also Harijan to claim that he is also the one who represents the Dalits. But Ambedkar at the same time was interrogating his entire vision and was saying he started newspapers like Janata, Bhutana. Now there were knights in the ministry, in the upper caste social structure, there were knights. But there was this knight who represented 85% of the population of this country. But this knight was a dumb dealer. Knight means a dumb dealer. The Murgana, Vaishnava, his nation, Gandhi's nation was a great nation. Dr. Ambedkar's nation was an ostracized India, a Vaishnava. And he wanted to make it. 
Prabhupada Gita. And enlightened everyone. These things, these, this Bible is not to be understood. And therefore, Dr. Ambedkar said that these of the opinion that believing that we are a nation, we are cherishing a great illusion. How can people turn beyond into several thousand past and be a nation? The sooner we realize that we are not as, as a nation in this social and psychological sense of the word, better for us. For then only that we shall realize the necessity of becoming a nation and seriously think of the ways and means of realizing the goal. That is very important. In annihilation caste, Prof. Ambedkar says a lot of things nation and nationhood and whether caste can really help us to make a good nation. Much also said something this in Samagrahamya. And he actually blamed the leaders of the society. And that time, the leaders of the society was the governing class, the governing class consisted of the Brahmins. And therefore, Mahatmaji Prabhupada, because of because he did not use the kind of term that modern scholars use now. And therefore, people said he was very crude. Even though he was crude, but he used the very term called Brahmin and Bhatta and Pandas. These were his terms, right? But he was actually referring to the dominant domination and this, the, the, this, the strategy of the dominant caste in subjugating the masses because that has to be understood. Now, Dr. Ambedkar explained, I will take seven moments. Dr. Ambedkar explained the meaning and the function of nationality and his views of nationality are very, very important. He says that nationality is, nationality is a social theory. It's a feeling of corporate sentiment of oneness which makes those who are charged with it feel that they are thin and thin. Now, if we are the people of innate nationality, then do we really feel one with our fellow citizens? That is a very, very important question. Many times, if anything is done for the sake of Dalits, Dalits becomes Dalit become the sole enemies of the non-Dalits. As if Dalits are Pakistanis. I mean, why should Pakistan be also a hated? That's another thing. But Pakistan as a nation, if anybody who is involved into anti-national activities or any any other country which harms the interest of our nation, would be our enemy. That is that is that is very certain. And we are we are no 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 doubt about it. But that is certain as if they are the enemies of this nation. That also has to be understood. It is therefore said that in India there is a nation within a nation. And a home there are there are speakers and scholars who say that caste feeling is so strong among Indians that every caste almost has to be So so the title nation within the nation and homes within the home. Every caste is so strong that every caste is a nation and it's the biggest hurdle in making of a strong nation. Dr. Ambedkar in the annihilation of caste writes that caste prevents. The Indian people, Indian caste people from forming the real strong nation. The caste system prevents common activity, and by preventing common activity, it has prevented the Hindus or the Indians from becoming society with a unified life and consciousness of its own kind, its own being. So the conflict between the one caste group and with another caste group, it is also because there are two traditions which we need to understand. One tradition is a Shaman tradition, another tradition is a Brahmin tradition. One tradition is a Vedic tradition, second one is a Sarath tradition. So, the Shraman tradition is the tradition of the people, usually uh, of the people who, who are into what termed as Shudras or Dalits or Tribalists. And the other tradition is the tradition of the dominant class in India. And therefore, if we really have to, I will write up such, and I will skip a lot of things, if we really have to make our nation a very, very strong nation, then there are certain things that we need to. Uh, to think of one that we need to accept we need to accept the very fact that there are real problems in we becoming a strong nation. Once you accept this, almost half the work is done. And therefore, third thing, second thing we need to do is we need to establish the rights of these three subjugated groups, namely the Dalits or the untouchables, the Muslims and the Hindu women. Only, only then, these are not these are the only these are not the only ways, but these are some of the ways which are suggested by Dr. Diyar Ambedkar. 
and he worked for them throughout his life along with a lot of other things and therefore while uh, giving delivering his last speech in, uh, in the Indian Constitution Assembly he, he said that we should not be under the delusion that we are a nation but there are two problems and he says and I quote him with this I end he said they form a union of trinity these, these three principles liberty equal to fraternity should be treated as unified ones and brought in the social life of India. They form a union of unity in a sense, and that to divorce one from the other is to defeat the very purpose of democracy. Liberty cannot be divorced from equality, and equality cannot be divorced from liberty. Nor can liberty and equality be divorced from fraternity. Without equality, liberty would produce the supremacy of a few over the many, and equality without liberty would kill individual nation. Without fraternity, Liberty and equality could not become a natural force of things. We must begin by acknowledging the fact that there is a complete absence of two things in Indian society. One, one of these is equality, which is absent. And on social plane, we have in India a society based on the principle of related inequality, which means alienation of some and degradation of the other. On the economic plane, we have a society in which there are some who have immense wealth as against many who live in abject poverty. I think this message of America should be kept in mind to see to it that we become a strong nation. So, thank you very much. I thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, uh, I don't know. Given the problem with this first time, I think we are Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Vandesh. It was a very informative and uh, insightful session. Now, this session is open for discussion. Any questions or uh, comments or anything to be clarified? You are most welcome. Ambedkar said that he took liberty, equality, fraternity not from prejudice but from Buddha. Yes. In fact, so we should not get confused. No, this exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful to serve for this. In fact, there have been a lot of attempts after the Ambedkar wrote the Constitution. There were several people who wanted to reject and go away from the acknowledging his efforts in doing this tremendous job, stating that, no, what he did? Who was getting uh, Ambedkar writing Constitution of India? So he took something from France, from France, something from Europe, something from America, he put it together and the country was made. That is not so. But from I mean, when I was in first standard, I studied political science. And my teacher, there was a book made by a university professor of Pune. That book included that these three principles were borrowed by America from French Revolution. But it was never told to us that they were taken by America from Indian philosophical sources and that too from the Buddha. Okay. And, and therefore, Ambedkar has to be understood properly. People have never acknowledged that Ambedkar could do something with a lot of sincerity and with a lot of honesty. The death of Ambedkar was, I don't know, suddenly people have taken Ambedkar in a big way. Uh, I know what part to cut there on the point of view, but then a friend of mine who asked me, Dr. Kadi, Shri Mahasra, you are uh, having these insights from it in a big way. Suddenly now, when people actually spend a stone on the Ambedkar Jainthi processions, you know, look at this, now suddenly the government is studying it like anything. Why is this? I told him, one should understand what makes the leaders at present to talk about Ambedkar is a question. Who compelled them and what compelled them to do this? You will get Thank you, sir. I have an announcement. No, sir. No questions. Okay. I think there are no further questions. Let us conclude the session of invited talks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh, for having uh, honored our invitation and uh,
and the Lord here and for being with us all these three days. Thank you, sir.